uh, hello everyone welcome to our e6 seminar for today the topic of our presentation is advances in software for wide area situational awareness with time series data um our speaker today is dr greg zoigel dr greg zoigel is an r and d fellow engineer at switzer engineering laboratories and leads a research team to develop wide area power systems analysis and control solutions he holds a phd in electrical engineering and computer science a master's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in electrical engineering all three are from washington state university he also holds a bachelor's degree in physics from northwest missouri university so let's welcome dr soigel and let's get yeah, to you yeah so that whole list means if i ever lose my job i'll never get another job <laughs> completely unemployable don't get too many degrees or don't get too many degrees until after you have a stable job I shouldn't say that. Get lots of degrees. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Um, yeah, so I'm at Schweitzer. I'm, I'm adjunct faculty here. I, I always forget to say that. Like, I just not in my bio anymore, but I need to add it. So I'm going to talk about time series software. I'm going to talk about, let's see, if I can I close that. Oh, I can't. I'm trying to get rid of the dismiss. Oh, I can do it from down here. No, you can do it. I'm sorry to get rid of that. Yeah, so it's a little bit bigger for everybody. Here we go. So welcome to everybody that's online, Danny and other people. So um, I want to talk about time series software and software that my group makes. So my group does a lot of things. We're, we're kind of a research group slash product group. So this software is one of the solutions that we provide. And I thought it'd be fun to share with you just what does production software look like that is in place at a utility? And I'll just click here and click here. Okay, so SEL's mission. Okay, how many of you guys know it? How many of you guys know SEL's mission statement? Anybody? Yeah. Right here. When I first went to SEL in 1998, they said, our mission is making electric cars safer, more reliable, and more economical. And I thought, that's interesting. I never really thought our company having a mission. I thought it was like, let's make lots of money. Let's <laughs> make cool things. <laughs> let's have fun. It's, yeah, and and as, I, as I stay at this company longer and get older, man, I really, really appreciate working at a company that has a mission statement because it can really guide decisions. So for example, if I'm talking to a customer and I need to do something to help them make their power system safer. I don't have to worry, should I, am I allowed to spend this money to help them make their power system safer? I can just do it because that's our mission. So it's really great. And, but, and, but I like to add the word simpler <clears throat> for our group because some of the stuff we do is software. And I feel like a lot of times software is just way too complicated. One of the things I want to show you is some of the things that we've been doing to help make our software simpler. <clears throat> All right, click down arrow. So we originally made this software for synchro phasers. How many of you guys, or gals, I shouldn't say gals, how many of you people know what synchro phasers are? Or heard the term synchro phasers? Everybody, who, who's never heard the term synchro phaser before? Okay. I mean, this is a big deal when I was a younger engineer because all we have is SCADA, SCADA, um, you know, it's asynchronous, it's scanned, which means you go, give me your measurement, give me your measurement, give me your measurement, give me your measurement, and give me your measurement with synchro phasers, it's a streaming. So like if you've taken a DSP class, like what is it, 464? Is that your senior level DSP class? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just assume that you're gonna get streamed samples. Then you go into industry back in the 80s or 90s or even 2000, you're like, these samples are not aligned, they're not streamed, they're not like, you know, like the, 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 the. So synchro phasers was a big deal. Still is. It's, it's amazing to me sometimes how challenging it is to get new innovative ideas adopted widely in the electric power industry. So maybe you guys will be, maybe you engineers, maybe future engineers will be as old as me someday saying, Has anybody heard of synchrophasers? Is this this new thing? Oh my goodness. But we realized that as we were developing this software, we didn't want to just focus on synchrophasers because. There's so much more data out there. So this software that we developed, it takes in what we call time domain data. I'll talk about that. Weather data, fire data, event reports. I'll mention that. Vaulted circuit indicators. We connect to EMS and SCADA databases. And then we kind of synthesize it all together. 
for a view for, for our customers. And what's interesting is like SEL's claim to fame is protective relays. That was like, when Dr. Schweitzer started the company in 1982 or 1984, he said, we should use computers to do all this electric power system control. And everybody said, that's the dumbest idea we've ever heard. This is fantastic. If you're starting a company and everybody says it's a bad idea, that's a good thing. Just remember that. So all your bad ideas, start a company with those bad ideas. Because the good thing is there'll be no competition. Right, because like all of our all of SEL's competitors at the time were saying, well, "This is crazy. That is, we shouldn't do this." And so they let SEL get just a massive running start. Um, so, anyways, in protective relays, there's a lot of data that's kind of stranded, like it's kind of stuck in this computer that's in a substation. And even today, it's kind of interesting. It's all the communications. So there's all this data. So we wanted to get this out of the devices and get it up to where people can use it. Okay, talk a little bit about, okay, so I kind of switched gears. I'll talk about power systems, talk a little about software. How many of you write software for your research or your classes? One person, two. Okay, let's include MATLAB as software. How many of you write software? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody not write software now? I don't think so. Unless you're in a lab and your research project is like hooking two capacitors up to an inductor. Okay, so um, it's interesting when you go into industry, you wind up working on multidiscipline teams, which is the best part. So like on my team, I have software developers, I have power engineers, and then I have business experts that are involved in marketing and selling and teaching. Well, we're all teaching. Um, and even, even amongst my software developers, I have those that are good at front end, those that are good at back end, those that are good at C sharp, those that are good at web development. And even among my power engineers, I have those that are good at oscillation studies and those that are good at protection. So I'll talk a little bit about software, even though it's not what you're studying, um, it's a part of when you get a job, if you work in this kind of a company like I am. So. One of the things we, when we were looking at developing this software is we were looking at the software that's already out there today, which is that ugly red stuff there. And this, um, this might look like the MATLAB code you've written where everything's hooked to everything. You ever write MATLAB like that? I'm like, after a couple of months, you're thinking, I don't even know how this works, but I need to graduate, so please. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're like, especially notorious is you have like a function call and you start adding stuff to it. Oh, I need this. Okay, I'll add whatever. Setting by. Oh, I need this. Oh, model. Oh, I need this. Voltage value, right? And that's the interface. I don't know. That interface is so cluttered. You're like, what is this function, right? And a lot of software in our industry tends to be this way. This is why I drew circles of everything hooked to everything. When we started developing this software, we thought, let's, let's think about how an, an iPhone works, <laughs> for example. Everything's an app. And because everything's an app, it has to have good interfaces. You can't like, when you install, I don't know what your favorite app is. What's your, who wants to tell me what their favorite app is? <laughs> All right, a map app, let's say. So if the, if the map app has to connect to a thousand other things inside that phone, good luck, you know, how easy it is to install, right? So the people at Apple, and they're very smart. They thought this through. So when we developed this, we really focused on everything making a modular app and then it forces you to have good interfaces. And then it also makes it easy to install things and uninstall things. And so like, what's really cool is if we have, let's see, what's my next slide? I don't know why, okay. So here's a, just a few examples of some applications we have. But like, for example, we have something called a frequency monitor. That's a pretty trivial algorithm. But let's like somebody said, well, I want a different frequency mo monitor algorithm. That's great, you just put a different app in, as opposed to, Oh, and this actually happens a lot in our industry where you're at, you, you've sold software to a utility customer and then you want to change something like the frequency monitor. Then you have to go to them and say, okay, now you have to reinstall your entire software and then you have to recommission it and everything. And they're thinking, what a nightmare. So the way we design this software, and that's really common in our industry, is now we can just go to them and say, oh, you want a different frequency monitor, just install the app or everything else is the same. Super cool. 
So we're very excited about that. Any questions so far? Um, so the other thing that we've done is we've used uh, modern technology like maybe heard of Docker, right? Or Docker, right. basically containerization. So not only is everything an app, are you okay with talking about software? You're thinking this is a power lecture. This is cool. Now you have to sit you know, you down. You have to be here. It's required. So you have to listen to me. I'll get to power stuff. Um, but um, everything's not only an app, it's in a container, and the container runs isolated, and that's to solve problems like if something crashes or fails, it doesn't bring down the whole system. Part of the reason I wanted to share this to you is because it's like, what does production software look like? Because you're writing all your MATLAB, right? And I've been there, and it's whatever, MATLAB. And then you get on industry, like, what does it look like to develop software that's got to ship to a customer, be installed, and then that utility relies on it. Like, this software is running at a utility, so if, they're, if a computer crashes, they're not going to be happy if the software crashes too, especially not today. They're going to expect, oh, that server crashed with the software automatically went over, so we're running on this server, right? And that's what this kind of technology allows us to do with our, with our customers. So for example, I'm just showing, hey, this, this operating system and this whatever it is nowadays, maybe it's a virtual machine, crash. Okay, so we can just move the, the, the apps over to another one and keep running. Especially critical in um, the control center, which is partly where this software is, lives. Um, you know, okay, I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Okay, so the other thing that we've, we've done work on is we call time domain. I don't know, there's probably, you know, it's just basically streaming samples, you can call it time domain, but as opposed to phasers. So you all know about how phasers work, I'm assuming. So when I think of a phaser, I think of it as a gigantic, lossy data compression thing. So it's like, I've got all this interesting power system information out there just waiting to be used for something. And then at the device, typically a blue box that we made, it provides a super narrow bandpass filter and just throws everything interesting away, right? And you're stuck with the phaser, the angle theta, right? Which is great when the power system is moving relatively slowly. Um, you know, for example, in the old days when you had a nuclear power plant, you turn it on, it's probably a switch somewhere, turn it on, and then it starts pumping out a gigawatt, and it's like a gigawatt plus or minus, you know, a picawatt all day long, right? It's wonderful. So in that case, phasers are great. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can look at the power flow on a line every five seconds, and it's not changing that much. And in today's world, we have inverters and wind and solar and all this complexity, frankly, that um, makes it so that you know phasers may not be as. I mean, they're still incredibly useful, but there's a lot more information that we can use. So we designed this software so it can take in streaming measurements. And then it, it aligns it with everything else in the database. So, you know, there's you guys see, do you ever know what SSO is? You heard that term? Subsequent oscillations or GMD, <laughs> have you heard the term GMD? Geomagnetic disturbances. Geomagnetic. That's the end of civilization when the sun throws off this big flare and disrupts all our power systems and society collapses. So we have to be ready for it. Could happen anytime. <laughs> so I actually have customers sometimes that will say, hey, can I use your device to measure uh, an oscillation that's at like 30 hertz or something? And I say, no, because I did my best to make sure that I got rid of all that information. I'm sorry. But you occasionally see papers where people try to do this. They're basically kind of reverse engineering the filter because the filter doesn't look like that, right? It looks like kind of bouncy bounce. So like we have devices that will send data at 3,000 samples a second. Aren't these nice slides? Are you should, so like when you're, when you're looking at my slides and you're thinking about the slides you make for your whatever, it's like got the two point font or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Just cram this up. This is made by our marketing department. I'm not taking credit for it. <laughs> so, it's nice when you have a marketing department that can help make your slides. I mean, they didn't make it for this presentation. I, I'm reusing slides, but 
when you're making slides someday, you're thinking someday a marketing department will make this slide. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's part. This one's even better. Look at that. You ever made a slide that nice? <laughs> I got some others coming up that are even better. So, so one of the things you've noticed is that as we talk about streaming data and synchrophaser data, it's a lot of data. So we can't ask our utility customers and partners to look at this screen all day long, just waiting for something interesting to happen. So um, we wind up doing, at my group, and this is a lot of what my power engineers do, is they're developing algorithms that are running kind of under the hood, and they're constantly monitoring all this streaming data coming in, you know, gigabytes of data. And, and so we do, we run real-time analytics, and then based on that, we, I'll show you later how we use the results, but that's a, a lot of, so we got my software developers, they're putting all this together and making it all work. And then the power engineers are developing the algorithms and that eventually get put into the code. Um, and so that's in typically power engineers will be writing in MATLAB or Python. Um, and then and then having to communicate it to the software team. I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but it's kind of interesting since I'm thinking about it. But when people, whenever you hear someone say, hey, when you're a student, you should learn how to communicate or learn how to write. Like, what? Why? Well, it turns out you got to communicate your idea to the software team so they can implement it effectively. And the, the main reason you want to communicate effectively is because it's a lot of work if they think of it differently than you thought of it. Then they spend two months developing it. Then they're like, hey, can you look at this? And you look at anything, this is not at all what I was hoping you would develop. And now you lost three months and now you're working nights and weekends to try to get everything right because the deadline never moved. So that communication side of being able to work with people of different disciplines because, you know, like computer scientists will kind of talk differently than power engineer or think differently. And so it's really important skill. I think that's something I've, as an employer, I value that really highly. Just as an FYI, like when we're interviewing and stuff, I, a lot of times I'm thinking, okay, I'll, I'll tell you an interviewing secret. A lot of times if I ask a candidate, hey, can you solve this power flow problem? And they can't do it. I'm like, eh, you know, it's a high pressure situation. Maybe they took the class two years ago. But if they can't communicate effectively or they have a hard time asking questions during the interview process, then I, that puts up more seed of a doubt in my mind than if they could, you know, get the exact right answer. Although exact right answers is good for tests. That encourages me not. Exactly. <laughs> so <clears throat> this is the fourth generation of the software. We actually started thinking about synchrophasers and power systems back in 2003. It's kind of fun. In 2003, there was some engineers at SEL thinking, could we put a PMU in Texas? Well, what? And probably just. Hey, we lost sound. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you, Norm.
also avoiding echo, so there is only one on. Let's try it. I turned this one on just now. You did? Mm -hmm. no, we can okay. hear you now. We can hear you now. Okay, okay, so can you hear me as good as before? Because now I'm talking to the laptop. Yes. It's good. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's good. Oh, okay. How about now? It works. Does it still work uh, now? Sorry. Yes, it's working. Okay. Because and, and then we could just do something else. So, anyways, oh, I went out. I'll tell you the story because it's you'll probably experience this in your career. Because I'm like, I'm the bad manager in this story. So you'll have lots of managers like me in your life. <laughs> um, so I went out and visited Hawaii Electric in April and I saw they were using the separate console. And and, they, and it wasn't. It was a, it was not really meant to be used in the control room environment. But I said to them, man, we should we really should do something to help you out. And this kind of goes back to the SEL values, right? Safe, reliable, economical power. So I came back to Pullman and I, I grabbed my team. And I said, hey, I just promised a customer we'd write brand new software and ship it to them in whatever, four months, by the end of the year. So anyways, so that might happen to you in your career. Um, but anyways, they did. They did a great job. I mean, I was on the team too. We all worked hard and got, and that's how that Synchrowave Central got started. And then the Synchrowave Operations just got started because we were working with San Diego Gas Electric and they wanted to use time domain synchrophaser data in a control center that um, operators are actually making decisions on. So previously, before we released the software, it was used, but they weren't always allowed to make decisions on it because of um, rules and requirements. So we did a lot of work in addition to additional, just making sure all the processes were in place, all the procedures were in place, so that somebody could look at this, look at the data on the screen and make a decision based on that. So that was another kind of lesson for your career. It's like you get all the algorithms done, you get all the code done, if you have the solution done, but then it could be a long time until the customer has all of the things in place to use it, processes, procedures, training, all these things that are needed because, you know, the power system has to work. <laughs> we can't put something in place and then figure it out after it goes live. All right. Let's see if I can advance the slide. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. This is another good slide that. So. Here's a question. I have 23. I was going to switch to the demo. <laughs> okay, let me do that. Okay. We'll see if we break anything here. So I'm going to turn that off and I'm going to click on this. Oops. And I'm going to click on. Oh, no, no, go to Windows. This one? Yeah. And then. This one? That's the one. Yep. Okay. And then make it full screen. Okay. <laughs> Please work. Okay. Oh, and nice. Then you can... Okay, oh, it's okay to start it. So, um, <clears throat> given some of the technical challenges we're having, I decided not to do a live demo. Good thing. So I recorded these ahead of time. Um, but um, the problem with recording them ahead of time, I realized after I recorded them, is I don't even know what I was doing. Like I'm moving the mouse around, so I'll try to synchronize my talking to what you're seeing on the screen, but it might be not quite perfect. But let me explain to you the basics of the software. So, <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I have that thing bouncing around like that. It's gonna drive me crazy, okay. Okay, so uh, across the top, there's a timeline. Basically shows events. So you see the little number two there. So there was two events at that time. There was a frequency event. There's a map. Well, let's keep it going because you'll see some cool things that goes. You'll just have to. Okay. So there's a map that updates live with all the other data. You can see it's it's kind of hard to tell, but it's it's streaming in data at the bottom. You can just barely see it streaming. So there's the frequency measurement, voltage values, phase angle chart, phase notifications in the top right. Um, but basically, what this is is this is the display that say an operator would be would have on the wall. Okay. I mean kind of at a glance, look at this and see are my voltages right. Okay. So you know the way the bar chart, there's a lot of thought that goes actually I also have people on my team which are called UI UX experts. So they're responsible for figuring out how does uh how does the 
how does a user want to use this? Because like just a software developer might think, well, I'm just going to do all this in courier font ASCII. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but like, that's what I would think too. But the UI people think this through. So for example, the voltages, I mean, this seems kind of obvious, but you'd be surprised how much you see weird software. But like, for example, the voltages, when they're normal, they're right in the middle. So the person sitting at their desk, they can look up, they, okay, that's that's it. They don't have to, Think anymore, as opposed to like having the normal be all wedged up against the side. You know what I'm saying? And then the frequency, this is a big one from them. They always say, hey, I want the frequency to be the big number. So I can glance up there and make sure the frequency is okay. Um, the other thing is you can go, okay, perfect. So notice how in the demo, this was selected back here to this time range. So now it's in historical mode. So basically, um, the user can slide this back and forth and look at historical data, everything updates together. But what's interesting is one of the comments we got back from utilities, and this is a long time ago, this is nothing new to us, but it's still, I think it's interesting, is when something's in real time versus historical, they want to really have a lot of visual indications that that's the case. Because the last thing you want is you want some operator to have this in historical, and then they forget to go back to real time. Then every time they look at this, like, ah, the frequency is still 59.927. Everything's fine. Meanwhile, it's at, you know, 38 and going down to zero. So we've actually even had some utility customers that have said, hey, when you're not in real time mode, I want this whole thing to be in, you know, purple. Maybe not purple. Red, crimson. Um, because, you know, they don't want to accidentally be confused and not be able to make an effective decision. So that's just, I don't know. You don't always think about that, but it's the, the, little, the little things. There's notifications in the top right, and I'll show you how those work in a second. Okay, so let me go to the next. Okay, so there's a couple different modes for this software. Um, this one I think is showing what we call the that overview mode so you can so the person can come in they're like okay i get this but i want to like look at a few things in more detail so click over come on click 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 see how fast it takes me to click this all right let's look here let's see or maybe this is oh this is the same hold on this is the same is this the same video we just looked at i think so oh okay well hold on a second i didn't it didn't advance the slide okay next slide now let's see if this one is it. There. I should have had something at the front that says, oh, oh, something new is happening. Let's see. Yes. Okay. Let me back it up. That happened too fast. Okay. So this is what we call asset investigation mode. So this is more for engineers, not operators. So an operator is typically not going to be doing this. They could be, but if, yeah, they could be if they if something happens, they want to investigate further. But also, a lot of times, engineers that support grid ops will be curious to know more about what's going on with this line. So, oh, hold on a second. Start. I think I went to the next one. Okay, let's do this again. Let's try this. No, okay, okay let's try this. Okay, yeah. So I click on the line. Click on the line. There we go. What it does, it brings up a set of displays of information about that line. So in this case, it's showing frequency and voltage magnitude. Um, and one of the things that we did that was really important is no matter what somebody selects, they always get the same templated displays, which is really important because a lot of times operators are working in a high stress environment. Um, it's, it's uh, I don't know if you ever had a chance, maybe some of your crew had a chance to be in an operations center or visit one. I mean, it's it's really serious business. So when they click on something, they need they want to know what they're going to see. They want to be able to um, navigate through software really easily because they got plenty of other things on their mind besides if I click on this line, what is the software actually going to show me? So everything is templated. Here's an example showing the frequency. You'll notice the weird teeth looking thing, those are dynamic limits. So for example, depending on different conditions, the alarm level or the note, the warning level could be different. Now we just simulated this with a sine wave. So normally the, normally the, the limits aren't good. 
I do really weird. Um, OK, let me see what else is in this. Any any questions about the software? Is this interesting? Yes, so the big frequency number is that for like a specific node that you're at, or is it like a certain area that's encapsulated? Good question. Typically, we think of frequencies being a global phenomenon. So now I'll show you in a minute. There's some plots that show during transients the frequency can be different in different parts of the power system. But like for a big number like that, it's pretty. It's pretty like doesn't matter what you measure; it's going to be almost exactly the same. This one's in this display is interesting here. Um, is it you know one of the things that's cool about working with customers and stuff is a lot of times they'll use what you invent in the ways you didn't anticipate. And it's kind of cool because you, you know we'll be down there talking to a utility. And they'll say, oh, I'm doing this in the software. And we've been watching them and we're going, you know, I never thought of anybody using this software this way, but now that you're doing that, it makes a lot of sense. So this one's interesting that we learned over the years. I mean, not recently, but a while ago, but a lot of times they put the currents, the time synchronized currents, make it super easy to access. The reason why is because at some utilities, when they get a fault, like on a transmission line, so it trips the line. Okay. The reclosers are going to reclose the line. And then if the reclosers fail to reclose the line successfully, it'll lock out. So now the line is de-energized. So then the operator is thinking, can I re-energize that line? And if you think about it, that's kind of a it's kind of a serious question because you're not there looking at it. You're in a room 500 miles later. You energize the line, you're putting power into something. Hopefully the line of loads, um, but you wouldn't want it to be putting power into a fire or putting power into something out that you don't know. So they use this current information to help give them additional information as to whether it's safe to reclose a line. I think I don't know if this is true. I've heard a long time ago they would just reclose it. <laughs> Bam, just and then if it, if it doesn't hold, they're like, okay, now we'll send a crew out there. Nowadays, of course, very careful. So it's just kind of interesting that they start using current measurements, something I didn't really expect them to use these current measurements for. It's also nice too because they get like, you know, obviously they get the breaker state and everything through their SCADA displays, but they also like to get this kind of like a second opinion, so to speak. You know, line trips, one one phase clears, that's what the, the targets show, that's what they get. But it's nice to come over here and say, oh, one current to zero and see it not just like a SCADA, thing, which is like it's a number, but they can actually see how it evolved and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of interesting. So a lot of times they look, they like to look at currents. Let's see what else is on this particular one. I hope this had the. No, OK, let's go to the next. See what this one's going to show. Ah, so this one is showing if you get a notification and how how do they understand what happened so here you'll notice i clicked on the notification there and then it brought up a display that shows everything they need to know about that particular issue automatically which is nice again because like i said the control center is a it's a high stress environment so you don't want to make uh, an operator Oh, there's an there's an alarm. There's a, a voltage problem. Let me go poke around in the software and try to figure out if I can figure out what happened. Right? You want them to click on click on the notification, and then, like I said, the power my power engineers develop all the algorithms to figure out what exactly should we show them. And if you make really good successful products, it shows them exactly what they need every time, and they're think, "Wow, this is awesome." And you make a really bad product. It, they click on it and they're like, this is not helping me, right? And it's amazing, just like in the consumer world, it's amazing how just a couple of bad experiences will make someone not really want to use your software ever again, forever. So it's kind of a hard hurdle to overcome. So you really want to, we really need to think through how they're going to use a software, how we can show them the information they need. My power engineers are thinking, what algorithms do I need to develop so that I can surface you know, precisely what they need to I'll show you some more about that concept in a minute. So here, notice we have the one line, and I think this is going to show as a person scrolls back and forth through time, the one line updates, 
you know, so they can look historically. What was the frequency before the event? What, what was the state of the breakers? What was the frequency after the event? What was the state of the breakers and things like that? Again, to help them figure out what happened <laughs> and what do they need to do. An operator told me once, one time he said, all day long, all I think about is, what's the state of the power system? Is it in a secure state? It's not, how do I get it back? Like that's their, that's like their mindset, right? So if we're developing this software, we need to help them with that thought process. And although what's funny is one operator told me recently with all the automation, now, we, now this operator, instead of thinking, is the operator, is, is the power system in a state, in a secure state? If not, what should I do next? He's more thinking, what just happened? Right, because like, fault on the line, the automation scheme figures out, oh, I switched this, switched this, switched that, I can reconnect more customers, so it goes fault, alarm on fault, switch, 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 power system's new state, and they're, you know, they're going, whoa. You know, and so it's it's a really hard job as an operator, especially nowadays, because there's so much automation. That's really tricky for them. Um, so um, also when we're developing these automation schemes, which we do a lot of, we also need to develop software to help the, the, the utility understand what our automation system just did. And that goes back to simplicity. The simpler we can make the automation scheme, the happier my customers tend to be. I'm explaining to them for 15 minutes why it did what it did. Usually not a good conversation. Okay, let me. So that's just things to think about when you're doing your research. When those network changes occur, does that get reflected in the graphical image of the different lines? It does. Yeah. Oh yeah. So oh, I I gotta I gotta get everything I want to talk about. So I gotta do. Let me do one more. Let me skip this one. Oh, that was the one you said. Okay, so last thing I'll show you on the demo part, and then I'll go back to the presentation, is we actually have PMUs out. Remember I said we had three back in 2000, whatever. We actually have PMUs across the US, and we stream all that back to Pullman. This used to be online, syncophages.com. Actually, SEL owns the syncophages.com URL, which is like, yes. <laughs> but it hasn't been running recently. One of my goals is to get it back working again, so I'd like you guys, gals, you could come and look at this. But anyways, so, what I wanted to show with this demo, though, is this concept right here. I'll just stop right here. So basically, um, going back to automating algorithms to help explain to a utility what happened on the power system. If if this happens, okay, frequency drops, and my software says, "Aha, low frequency." It's not super interesting to the utility that like, yeah, thanks a lot. I can tell the frequency is low, right? What they want to know is why is the frequency low? And what should I do about it? Who do I call? So one of the things that we've released relatively, relatively recently is some additional algorithms that do a lot better job at giving them information. So for example, now instead of doing a frequency alarm, which we still would do, it also just puts right on the display frequency trip, and it'll tell them what generator tripped offline. Um, so, which is nice because a lot of times um, we've kind of learned over the years they don't even want to use their mouse. They get plenty busy. So, if I have to tell them to go, oh, the frequency slow, go click on this notification. Like, ah, uh, no, I don't want to play this. <laughs> right. So, the fact that it just pops up right there and says, hey, this generator tripped. Here's the number to call to tell them to get it back online. I'll dial it for you, right? <laughs> that's that's good software. Okay, let me go back to my presentation. So I go here, here, stop sharing, right? Ah, oh, yeah. And I think this is where I left off. Are you allowed to say which utilities are currently using the software? Um, we have we have several hundred customers worldwide, actually, um, which is which is interesting because it, it, it there's a fair amount of time on our group that's covered by support, right? Just hand holding, answering questions, getting things set up. It depends on your personality. Some people um, don't like that. Some people really like it. As a matter of fact, 
was talking to a recently hired power engineer from WSU. And one of the things I have him do is tech support. That's not all he does, but anyways, I asked him a couple weeks ago, I said, what's your favorite part of your job? He said, tech support. Oh, that's cool. It's because like you get a phone call, somebody has a problem, you answer their, you help them, like you help you get that instant feedback. And they're like, and they say, hey, thank you. Now this is working, right? So it's pretty cool. It's actually one of my favorite jobs is helping a, a customer. And a lot of times, again, these are high stress environments. So a lot of times you get someone who says, I'm in a substation. This doesn't work. I need it working now because I'm trying to commission and meet a deadline, right? So we get called like that weekends, nights. And, you know, it's honestly for almost every day I know at SEL, it's not, oh man, I got a customer at eight o'clock on Friday. It's more, hey, this just happened last Friday. I got this call. I spent an hour helping them out. It was super cool, right? So I say that to say to answer your question, we have 700 customers and it does wind up having a fair amount of just helping. So I'm going to end with. Uh, an algorithm. Since it's a well, grad student, you're thinking, somebody is he going to show some math? So I'm going to show an algorithm we developed recently. Um, this is bad. We typically, would like to tell our customer ahead of time, "Hey, that piece of equipment is going to catch on fire in three days," which would, I mean, that's the best software, right? Fantastic. You can sell a lot of that. We don't quite get there, but we do have some interesting technology. So this is another marketing slide. All your slide decks should be like this when you're doing your defense. Just a picture <laughs> and some text. I think that's a specific photo, and I'll put it. So basically, you all know there's the transmission lines, the power transformer, current transfer, voltage transfer, all this stuff. So one of the challenges with utilities is if all of this can fail. Okay. But in particular, for the for the algorithm I'm going to share with you, that voltage transformer can fail. And that's kind of a bummer because you need it to the relays are using the voltage, the SCADA system is using the voltage, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, typically, what we've seen is the kind of the existing methods is in a protective relay. If it loses the voltage, it gives an alarm. But again, that's kind of the example of the fire. It's like, you know, you're an engineer, you're working in the control center, you get an alarm. Oh, the bolt, the voltage, the PT failed. I mean, thank you for the alarm, but now it's an emergency. I got to go dispatch a crew. I got to figure out it's like my my protection system is down. So it's grateful for the alarm, but. I would prefer to have known some days in advance. The other um, method is SCADA based protection, but SCADA, -based, SCADA is really slow. So it's sometimes hard. And I'll show you the algorithm. You'll see why SCADA doesn't work as well. So, well, here's an example of SCADA not showing a lot of information. And this is our software. Okay. So we had a customer come to us and they said, hey, we noticed with the high resolution time series data in your software, we noticed that we were getting these little itsy teeny tiny spikes on the C phase voltage. Here's my next slide. Okay. Oh, a little animation. So the voltage drops like this. And then they went and serviced the fuse. And then it got better. So it was what they were happy about is that with the software that we had sold them and with the PMUs, they had noticed these little spikes. They had dispatched someone out to go service the transform or the, the sensing transformer, and then it fixed the problem. So it saved them from the emergency of this thing failing sometime in the future. But what they said was, it'd be nice if we didn't have to stare at the display all day long to look at the little spikes. Can you guys develop an algorithm? And this is also kind of an interesting story because a lot of times our, our work in, in, in industry, it's not always us just sitting in a closed room thinking of some cool invention. Like a lot of times it's because we were talking to a utility, talking to a customer, they came and said, hey, what about this? Then we went and thought about it. And a lot of times there's like a back and forth and then we invent something new. So, you know, it would have been, I mean, I guess in a perfect world, 
we would have said, let's develop an algorithm to detect some little noise, but that's not always how it works. In this case, it was a customer that came to us, said they saw this, and they asked us to develop the algorithm. So then they had another case. I will get to some math this year. Um, I mean, this one was really bad. Like, you don't even need an automated algorithm to tell you something's not right here. I mean, look at how big it is. Like, there's probably alarms going off everywhere. Um, and what they did is they went and they serviced it. Um, I think they actually just tried to clean it or something. And then they put it back in service and then not kept doing it. So they finally replaced it and then it fixed it. Okay, so I asked one of my power engineers to come up with an automated algorithm that can run in our software and that would, you know, do all this stuff with us. So this is how the algorithm works. This is the best part of the whole presentation. Like, ah, oh, the algorithm. How exciting. I was waiting for this moment. <laughs> so first, we pre-process the measurements. Then we detect the failure. Then we post-process. Every algorithm on planet Earth looks like this, right? Like, have you ever made something that didn't look like this? First pre-process, then do something. OK, that's all I can show you because it's all confidential. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You guys did throw me out of the room. OK, so when we do it for the voltage, we do the pre-processing. First, convert to per unit. Everybody knows what per unit is. On the phase angle, take the derivative to get phase angle into frequency. Do a median filter. You guys, and gals, you guys heard of a median filter? Basically, it's a way to, it's a nonlinear filter. You kind of throw out the biggest, throw out the smallest, keep the one in the middle, and it gets rid of some noise. Particularly useful after a derivative, because we all know derivative is a noise amplifier. Then we do some interpolation, so that's pre-processing. And then you can see the cool plots, magnitude, before and after converting to per unit, not very interesting. <laughs> Just change the vertical axes. But the phase angle, you know, you went from this stuff to, uh, I'm pointing at the screen for those of you online, right there. And then there's the base just of the algorithm. So first, um, there's a, we take the original signal and we subtract a low pass filter version of it. Everybody know what that is? You take a signal and then you subtract a low pass version of the signal and you add it back in or subtract it. Yeah, yes, one way to think about it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically a high pass filter, right? Yeah. So that's a high pass filter. We could have just said high pass filter. But the reason we didn't is because power engineer that developed this, he developed he designed a low pass filter in MATLAB using, you know, it was easier, I think. Anyways, so then you'll notice there's a subtraction. So we take the A phase result and we subtract the B phase result. And that's the top epsilon AB. And then we take the B phase result and subtract the C phase result, and then the C A phase. Okay, so here's a question for you. Anybody have any thoughts on why we do that? I'll be impressed if you know, because it's it's not an op, it's not a comp I mean, when you hear it, you think, oh yeah, of course, but it's not totally obvious. What specifically you lost? So why the algorithm plays a high pass filter, okay, and then it's going to go and, and set an alarm. But why, before we do anything further, we subtract A phase from the B phase, B phase, or B phase from the A phase, the C phase from the B phase, and the A phase from the C it phase. It can be used for detecting unsymmetrical faults. You're close. You're close. Anybody else? Okay, so here's the thinking. The thinking is we want to get rid of common mode things. So for example, if all three phases went low than high, probably not the A phase fuse failing, right? It's probably some transient that flew through the power system. Um, so that's the intent of it is to make, you know, you don't expect all three phase, all three now, there could be some common mode thing in the sensor that makes all three fa fail at once. But you kind of think, hey, one's going to fail or another going to fail. So it gets rid of anything that all three C. All three C, S, E, not C, but C. OK, then we do a low pass filter. Does that make sense what I said about the common mode? OK. Then we do a low pass filter to get rid of noise and stuff. Think magnitude compared to a threshold. And then we have to undo. 
to say the A phase is the failing PT, we have to undo the difference. So that's what these and beats do. That's the basic algorithm. It's basically derivative, the catch spikes, filter, get rid of the common mode. And then, so this is, you can see plots of things. So on the left and the top left corner is the magnitude. And on the top right is after all those processing steps. And you can see those big spikes there. You're thinking, ah, oh, that might be something that we can use to give us an indication that this, this is a kind of a heuristic algorithm, right? Like there's many kinds of algorithms. One is you start from quantum mechanics, then you develop Newton's equations, and then basically cover your algorithm. That's like a first principles algorithm, which is the best for a PhD. Then a lot of times in industry, you wind up with more heuristic, like, okay, I've got this signal, this signature. How can I figure out a reasonably good algorithm that will, you know? So this is more of that latter category. Definitely not useful for graduate work. I don't know, maybe it is. I bet I bet you've developed heuristic kind of algorithms for your okay. Um, and then you can see so the gray stars is when we started getting alarms from that sensor. Okay, so it's interesting here. If I go back, I'm almost done. If I go back here, so I'm looking at the output of this this comparator. So anytime this is above a threshold, I send an, an alarm. Okay. But if you think about it, it's kind of a bummer because what the operator would see is alarm, no alarm, alarm, no alarm, alarm, no alarm, 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 alarm no alarm, right? Like that. Guarantee you, if your software does that in the control center, they will uninstall it. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not good. So that this isn't quite enough because of the fact that it just does alarm, 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 then, you know, so what we had to do after that was do some further long-term averaging of all those alarms. And then have you, have you ever seen this box with the little slash line? Where have you seen that notation before? Like a transform between the, the U axis. And the yeah, good, good. It's actually simple. That's what we call a pickup dropout timer. So basically this says, this signal has to be high longer than time sub P, time pickup, before I'm going to assert the output. And if it goes low, it's got to go low before us longer than a certain time before I deassert the output. It's kind of crazy. When I first started working at SCL, I saw those things everywhere. Like every time I opened a spec, there's one of those. And I thought, what is this thing? So I had to ask a power engineer. Okay, so when I first started. And I said, okay, let me explain to you. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of handy though. For this very reason, right? Gets rid of all the spurious stuff. So then that's the result. Okay. All right. So let's thank our speaker for all the very discussion. It was a very engaging talk. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll open up for questions. Uh, let's see if we have. So if you're asking question online, just um, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and and speak, or you can. Post a question online. Okay. I'll take questions yeah. here. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I have a question regarding the beautiful software you showed earlier. Uh, so, like, I, I have actually a couple of questions. So, first of all, what's the name of that software? Synchrowave. Synchrowave. So, yeah, uh, is it uh, as you mentioned? Is it uh, enabled? Is it Docker embedded? Uh, enabled? Like, can you run it on Linux as of now? Yeah. That, that's it. Yeah. In the same way that you showed that historical data as well as it does the real time analysis as well as we can move over a historical window in time yes. to analyze the state variables. Does yeah. it also um, um, give some predictions uh, for the future uh, state variable values? It it doesn't. So it does the algorithm that I display. I explain to do all the explaining what happened to the fire system, but it and then it predicts in the sense of like the PT failure thing is predicting that there's going to be a failure in the future. But yeah. it doesn't actually do like a state trajectory prediction. Okay. Like it's projecting out the voltages and the frequency in the future on the display. Okay, then uh, I guess yeah, that's uh, that that's fine. So some yeah. statistical analysis must be yeah. done on the state variables. Yeah. So yeah, the final and like most important question uh, I was wondering about was uh, like they must be using some lower level uh, programming languages to uh, process these uh, like millions of uh, like timestamp data, right? And not MATLAB or Python. So. We use primarily C sharp. Yeah. And Go 
Okay, you're gonna go. Yeah. And JavaScript. And well, React, but that's JavaScript. That's pretty much what you do. Oh, uh, so for data analysis, I assume that's Go then. Yeah. Yeah. No, like I said, the the power engineer will do development in Python or MATLAB. Typically, the software developer will re-implement the algorithm in software. Yeah, and they might the choose C, uh, they might choose C sharp. Yeah, that's uh, like uh, for UI. Uh, I'm I'm only asking about the backend. Yeah, C sharp still. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Do you have something like like the user level, admin level? Uh, oh yeah, yes, definitely. We have a lot of cybersecurity. I didn't even touch cybersecurity. That's huge. Um, Yes, so there's authentication and there's all different user levels and there's just a ton of stuff. So it's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah. So you have emphasized the simplicity a lot. So how do we know it's important? Yeah. Good question. I you know, it's in, you know, if anybody's been at SCL, you'll notice the emphasis on simplicity. And Dr. Schweitzer one time said something that always stuck with me. He said, a lot of times people don't trust simplicity. Like it's gotta be complicated. Like if it's simple, they think, well, how can I make this more complicated? So simplicity is tough. It's a great question. Um, sales. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, you compared applications with the iPhone. Yeah. So in synchro way, we've done or we have done already, like we have a, a kind of operating system and different if developers can use their application ah. like Play Store. And yeah. So we actually have had third party developed apps on our software, but the thing is, unlike a phone, when there's a problem in the control center, they're calling SEL. <laughs> and if I don't know what that app is doing, they're not, nobody's going to accept, oh, we had a third party develop that app. I don't know what it's doing. You know what I'm saying? So we're super careful about, I don't actually, the last third party app, quote unquote, we actually pulled the entire code base in house and we made sure we understood it thoroughly before we shipped. Sanjeev, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Greg. It's, it's a really interesting talk. So the one question is, I have uh, the root cause. Do you really do the root cause analysis on the data that you do it? And what what the time and the time scale you generally think of? Because you're talking about the automation. I mean, maybe the future will be that uh, the case because it's completely automated and will take the decision on its own. So how the root cause and uh, what's the time scale it can take in? Yeah, I think you're talking about like the automation schemes, like why an automation scheme did what it did. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, yeah, so if I know the root cause of the any event and then that will be automatically fixed by the, the controllers, what you have in, in hand or maybe the control center will have the access to. So yeah, yeah, we actually provide, I have a whole nother product line I haven't talked about that software for root cause analysis. Because I don't know, I could do a future seminar on that one. Um, but yeah, I agree. They, they, Utilities and SEL, we always want to understand what happened at a root cause. As a matter of fact, really quickly, we have a 10 year warranty. Um, and one thing about our 10 year warranty is that we've actually never charged a customer when something, one of our devices has failed. Um, and was super, it was, it's really genius. I mean, I really, I mean, Ed, Dr. Schweitzer thought about a lot of things when he started the company, but the concept of making it known throughout the industry that you can send a product back to SEL even after 20 years and get it replaced. Um, you might think, well, that costs SEL a lot of money. It does, but the cool thing is, and this answers your question about root cause, every time one of our devices does something wrong, we get it back. Think about how cool that is, because we get to figure out, oh, that capacitor failed. Oh, that IC only lasted 10 years. Oh, that diode, right? So we roll all that stuff back into our development. And you know, we manufacture in the USA, and that's also a wonderful thing because we roll all that back into manufacturing. So kind of to your point, root cause is really important to our culture, not just from the customer perspective, but also for our devices. 
Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you have some devices with 3000 frames per second of sampling rate, right? So uh, are they time stamped or are they slow? Yeah, time stamped. Time stamped? GPS time stamped. So why aren't they being used instead of PM? <laughs> Good question. Well, because, you know, synchrophasers kind of became uh, po uh, possible in 2003 and we're still as an industry deploying them. So yes, the time domain called time domain or streaming, it's definitely becoming available, but getting it to be in a deployable state just takes a long time. I have a follow up not, question, sorry. Yeah, not just because of process procedure, but just because of the bandwidth it requires and the, you know, the, the communication technology and just so much, but it's a good question. It takes, it's amazing how <laughs> it's a conservative industry because Stuff has to work. Like there's no way stuff can't work. Okay, good. Yeah. So so at, at the follow-up question was um what's the relative cost difference between synchrophaser and actually using a point of wave measurement device? Oh, that's a good question. So in terms of the device and the software, zero. Okay. Um, that's actually something interesting, is that a lot of times the devices that they buy from SEL, the software is a small percentage okay. of the whole thing that they're trying to do, uh, which is Kind of interesting. It 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 helps us understand our customers' priorities when we really understand that. So yeah. So so actually zero, like no difference. Wow. Effectively, I mean, it might be small. So the the only obstacle to replacing them is actually building the infrastructure to use the data. Yeah, or when you use the word replacing, so that's another good thing. To replace a device is incredibly expensive. Like it's probably ten times the cost of because you gotta get a crew, put the process in place, roll out there, de-energize de the line, put it in recommission. I'm like, oh, the device is $5,000 and it cost me $50,000 for the swap out part. So do, do you believe that the new devices that will be going out will be these point of faith then? Um, that's a good question. I think slowly, more and more. I Actually, what I see happening is, is they're being put in key locations. Uh -huh. So someone's got a place was like, wow, we're having some weird problems here. Let's put one of these point of weight weight devices right here. Okay. But not like broadly. So so more inverter based resources, more yeah, point where you're seeing problems. Or maybe they're having a power quality problem or something. Anyone else? Any other question? I think there's a new message. Let's see. Okay. Wait, wait, one yeah. more question. Oh, yeah. One last. Sorry, you guys are like, I want lunch. <laughs> you're keeping me from lunch. Okay, so <laughs> we have seen this uh, synchro wave system being deployed over over a wide area, like maybe maybe the whole country and the whole HVMP system. But how far do you think that this can be implemented on a distribution feeder level? Where yeah. we can monitor a lot of IBRs. Yeah. With maybe place a PMU on every IBR and yeah, like kind of reduce the scale of the implementation. I think I think when you go to distribution, that might be a place where our industry just jumps past synchrophasers. Yeah. And goes like, to point of view. Yeah. It's hard to uh, historically utilities have had a hard time justifying PMUs at the distribution level because the angles are pretty tiny. And so it might be a case maybe where they just say, okay, forget it. We'll go skate it straight to point of wave. Mm -hmm. That's uh, exciting. Yeah. yeah. A lot of data. All right. Thank All you, right, everybody. Let's thank our speaker today spending time with us and we will call it end of the seminar today thanks everyone thank you. Thank you.